Okay. And also this might take a little bit less than two hours. If you guys want, we can do some coaching at the end um, or we can end early depending on what everyone would like. Okay, so. Here we go. So, and that's the end. We want to start in the beginning. So this is Attachment Styles 101. So it's about basically learning about the different attachment styles and how they kind of affect your life. I um, recently, I've come across like Gabriel Mate. He's a very famous person for attachment styles and for like healing trauma. And he has this quote, um, two people, people have two needs, attachment and authenticity. When authenticity threatens attachment, attachment trumps authenticity. And I thought that was really interesting because People, as kids especially, we want to be connected to the caregivers. And regardless of what's happening, they're our safety net. And if we're not connected, if they're not meeting our needs or like, you know, for survival, then basically we'll give up our authenticity, who we really want to be, to stay alive, essentially. So I thought that was a really interesting quote. Um a little bit about me. So I'm an artist. I'm also an illustrator and a designer. Um, and for years, I was attempting to do like paintings and do design work, like graphic design. And I just never really could feel the vibe for it. And then I started doing coaching and I started adding the design element and the illustration and the art stuff to it. And I absolutely love it. So I do all these worksheets. I do I have an Instagram account that I've been keeping, I've been posting for over a year and I do these infographics. And um, so I've been doing those and it's like mental health, personal development kind of stuff. I used to have CPTSD. Um, sometimes like I'll have like minor things, but for the most part, it's gotten a lot better. Um, I was fearful, avoidant, leaning, anxious, preoccupied. And I was married before and um, I was probably leaning more DA, um, which is dismissive avoidant. And I don't know, like, if, we'll obviously go into the attachment style so you learn more about it, if, whatever you do and don't know. Um, so the last couple of years have been transform transformational for me. I've been doing a lot of work. I joined something called the Personal Development School. And for the last three years, I've been doing a lot of work on myself. I've been making my, like, changing my my reality, like I've been learning to be more secure, financial area like life, um, working on my relationships, all that stuff. And I want to, my mission is to help people like you so that you also can have, um, so you can have the same. Uh, I'm currently coaching. Um, like I said, I'm creating, um, and I do mostly like relationship coaching, but I do help people with anxiety. I've helped them with anxiety, other kind of issues as well. Um, and I've been creating workbooks on Etsy. Um, I started doing these workshops and I'm also doing, just so you know, I do have Ask the Coach tw um, twice a month on Fridays. I just did one yesterday. Um, that is on my meetup group. And um, I'm also Reiki certified. So I can also do Reiki for people. I'm Reiki too. Um, which is a spiritual kind of thing. So with that, I'll do like a little spiritual coaching kind of stuff mixed in with the Reiki. Um, yeah. And then, and then fun facts. I like cats hiking. I used to be a teacher. I used to teach preschool. Okay. So if you'd like, you can participate um, in a chat or you can speak if you'd like. Anyone want to say what they know about attachment? And you're welcome to unmute or talk if you would like. Um, I'll say something. Awesome. Hi, Dan. It's not what you're going to expect. That's okay. But, but in Buddhism, they're not considered good. 
Wait, what? In Buddhism, they're not considered good. Yeah, that's, um, I think what you're referring to is attachment, right? The idea of non-attachment, right? I was being a little bit playful. It, <laughs> uh, yeah, the, 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 the Buddhists, for, for them, attachments are a form of uh, expectations, which can be a source of disappointment and suffering. Yeah, yeah, I've heard that. I've heard that. I've also heard um, if someone is a mother, um, I had one person tell me it was attachment parenting, um, which is apparently because um, I am currently a part time nanny and it was really interesting. So, yeah. Any other answers? Okay, um, I guess we'll we'll go on then. So, okay, I put in the chat that I think it can change. Oh yeah, for sure. Sorry, I didn't see that. Oh yes, no worries. Yes, um, it it can definitely change over time depending on your relationships. If you are, an example, fearful avoidant, um, it can change based on who you're with, um. They tend to like, if you're with someone who's more dismissive, you might be more anxious and vice versa. Um, also, it can change based on like if you have a traumatic event with someone, if you have a bad relationship, it can change. If you have a good relationship, it can change. Um, it can. So it, it does establish when you're as a young kid, but it's not completely set in stone. Yeah. Thank you for that. Is your name on? How do you say it? Anna? Anna? Anu. Anu. Nice Thanks. to meet you. Nice to meet you. And then Trina, she said, I took two different quizzes. One came back as fearful of and another one secure. Um, yeah, I I think it's possible when you take those quizzes, it depends on how you're answering. So if you are feeling really good about yourself, you might come out as more secure. Um, or if you're not, or based on a different situation, um, but I do think that we can mimic, I've seen some people that are insecure and they came out as more secure because um, you can tell from their actions um, and how their thoughts kind of ring. But again, it's not set in stone when you take those quizzes and whatnot. Um, I... Okay, so this is attachment. So the very basic definition of attachment is that it's an emotional bond that forms between an infant and a caregiver. Um, think about all the animals out there like cats and whatnot, um, and mammals, <laughs> I had to say cats, but um, mammals and just how they kind of like monkeys or how they, they attach to someone and they take care of each other. Um, humans are actually one of the, the most like, the babies need their human. Their, their caregiver versus some of the animals are not as needed for the parents, so to speak. Um, so attachment is the infant's first coping system and can be thought as a prim primal need. So infants are essentially helpless and need someone to take care of them and create security. Out of all the mammals, humans are the most helpless and really need their caregivers to survive, which is, yeah, basically what I just said. Um, but um, it's a need. It's a need. So when, for example, if you are more anxious, preoccupied, and you have a need for like, you feel like you're needy, or something, just remember that however you're acting, um, it's based, there's a need underneath there. And just recognize, you know, you can work with it, essentially, rather than judging yourself. Um, there's four type of, types of attachment styles. So one is secure and three are insecure. They are anxious, preoccupied, fearful, avoidant, or sometimes known as disorganized, um, dismissive, avoidant, and secure attachment. And like I said, attachment styles developed in, that they're developed in childhood and they can affect our adult relationships. Um, and again, traumatic events, other relationships, they can change our attachment styles. And then the good news is if you are insecure and you are repeating patterns, 
and you keep on getting the kind of same relationship or keep on having certain troubles, it is possible to change your attachment style. I know that I was very fearful of wind. Um, I was very, I wasn't volatile, but I was definitely in inside. I was having a stormy environment, very I had a lot of emotional dysregulation and I can tell you that I'm becoming more secure over time. So it's possible. So um, now what we're going to do is we're going to do a little quiz. So I'm trying to make it fun. Um, so I hear someone. Um, okay. I'll just be back here and I'll change my clothes so we can go down after the phone. But we're not, I can't do that until at least 5 30. So if you want um, a second here. Um, can everyone make sure they're muted unless they're wanting to talk? Okay. All right. So there's uh, four attachment styles. Each picture represents an attachment style. So anyone want to guess, um, you can put in the chat what the first one is. Or you can say it. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yep, secure. For sure. What about the second one? That that could be kind of hard. <laughs> um, this I would put as, yeah, mm -hmm, avoidant. Yeah, for sure. Um, it could be even dismissive avoidant. Um, fearful avoidant, the idea is that, yeah, mm -hmm, avoidant. What about this one, the the third one with the girl on the phone? Yeah, yeah, anxious, preoccupied, yes. The phone, dismissive. <laughs> um, if you are, um, I guess, you know what? Um, dismissive avoidant tend to have a lot of coping mechanism. So they do go on the phone a lot sometimes. Like if not, it's not all set in stone, but yeah. <laughs> Deceived. What what do you mean by that? <laughs> um okay. And then the fourth one. Uh, um, the fourth one I would put as maybe, yeah, yeah, fearful of wooden, because I I was coming up with the the tug of war kind of thing. Fearful of wooden often has like hot cold. They can't decide what they want sometimes. Um, but again, and remember when I'm saying all this, like not like one shoe doesn't fit all feet essentially. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and here's where the quiz really, um, this is a, this is more of the guest attachment style. So these are kind of put in each voices. So here's the first one. And then when I get done, you can let me know what you think it is in the chat. So, okay. So Mary becomes anxious when she texts her boyfriend and an hour later, she still hasn't respond. He, he still hasn't responded. What if something happened to him? She thinks. Maybe she doesn't want to have a, maybe he doesn't want to have a boyfriend. Maybe he found someone better than me. I'm not good enough. She continues to think these thoughts and her anxiety increases. As she does, she texts and even calls him again and again, texts like, are you there? Are you ignoring me? She becomes desperate <laughs> to rebuild the connection because without him, she feels lost. <laughs> mm. <laughs> what do you guys think? Uh-huh. For sure. For sure. Yeah, Don, I, I get it. It can be really tough because you feel this anxiety. You want that connection. And then if you're with someone who's more dismissive, avoidant, let's say, they might be like ignoring it, which probably makes it worse. Yeah. Yeah, that can be hard. Yeah. Um, it's hard to tell whether someone 
I guess you would have to figure out like the more you know, the more you can guess whether they're secure or not. Um, we are going to go over each individual attachment style, which would help with that. Um, okay, here's the next one. So Ryan likes to keep to himself. He's okay to connect to people, but he keeps but he keeps himself from having deeper relationships with people. He doesn't like to be emotional. Logic and practicality seem better for him. When trouble arises in his life, he seeks comfort within himself. He can't trust others to be there for him. And when it gets really bad, he seeks creature comfort, such as video games, television, scrolling on social media, or working. In romantic relationships, he's okay with having a girlfriend, but he only likes to see her once a week. And still he keeps to himself and doesn't like to be vulnerable even to her. What attachment style do you think that is? Close. Yeah, definitely avoidance. Yes. Yeah, I would peg it as probably dismissive avoidant, but you're right. Someone who is fearful avoidant can, um, you can actually have a secondary attachment style or in relationships, especially if you're fearful avoidant, you could be switching from one side to another. So yeah, fearful avoidance, especially when they're leaning DA, um, dismissive avoidant, they can actually be like that. Yeah, it's definitely. Yes? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan is my twin. <laughs> That's so funny, Trina. And Patty, yeah, you you relate to that one. Yeah. Um, okay, let's do the next one. So, Susie sometimes gets described as confusing because at times she seems like she wants to connect to others and at other times she seems to go cold. She can sometimes be volatile, which pushes people away, and she has trouble trusting people. She is always looking for reasons people will disappoint her or let her down. What attachment style is she? Fearful, for sure. Uh-huh, for sure, yeah. Thank you, Don. Oh, I didn't to speak. <laughs> huh? You guys are welcome to speak. I'm totally fine with you. My speaker was on. <laughs> no worries. You can totally participate. Um, totally fine with that. You can also use chat, whatever you feel comfortable with. Um, the next one. It's relatively easy for John to become emotionally close. Yes. Um, to others. Yet he also is well aware of his and others' boundaries and doesn't seek connection out of desperation but out of a secure space. He's able to communicate to others and well aware of his needs. He seeks harmony and balance in his relationships, is able to ask for help when needed, but can also be independent. What attachment style is he? He's secure. He's my other twin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say healthy. What? What, Patty? I was going to say healthy. Oh, <laughs> healthy. yeah. Healthy, uh -huh. yeah. Secure attachment, healthy relationship, right? Mm hmm For sure. Um, and then, um, yeah, once you guys, um, like, I put the survey above. I'll put it again later, too. But um, if you guys do the survey, or at least I get your email names, I can send you the thing, but this cool, this is a cool link. I'm not going to open it now, but I thought it was interesting because it basically has a T like uh, using TV shows um, as attachment style. Because when you watch movies, you can start after doing this, you can start pointing out the different attachment styles in the movies or TV shows. So I thought that would be fun. So, all right. Going on. So why is attachment styles, like, why are they important? Um, they influence our, the short answer is they influence our adult relationships, like with your work, your family, your career, friendships, romantic. Um, so how you relate to people in general, how, rela how do you relate to yourself? How do you treat yourself? 
Um, what are your thoughts to yourself? Like, are you putting yourself down or not? You know, um, and oftentimes they, so they can carry in, into our adult lives. And as I said here, can cause havoc in our lives mm-hmm. or things don't always go the way you want, you know? Um, so that's why it's important because, you know, our relationships is, ev- it's everything essentially, even like if you think about money, relationship to money, relationship to food. Um, so physical objects as well. Um, we're going to do a few videos here. Um, let me know if, um, I might have to like undo the share and do sound. So let's make sure if you can't hear, please let me know. So we're going to watch three segments of videos, um, just so you can kind of get the feel. Cause these are some videos that I really liked. So, hi. Right. Let me unshare and then reshare. So, okay. And I think I won't be able to see you, but I think you can hear me. So, and let me know again in the chat if you cannot hear the video if it needs to be louder. So the first video, we're going to do a few segments from this video. So the first segment is these are kids and they show the difference. They only do three attachment styles in here. I believe it's dismissive, anxious, and secure. They don't do fearful about it. But um, this will give you an idea of how it shows in kids and also the reason why I'm showing to you this to you is sometimes this even reflects in our adult relationships. We just have a little bit different of behavior, essentially. So here's the first clip. You. Share. I feel. But she'll survive. The key moment in the experiment is the child's reaction to her mother's return. The important clue is whether the baby's able to become calmed down by the contact with the mother, get back to play. Sometimes it takes. And do you see that this one would be secure? Um, What? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to continue it. And the mother is out. Who's only interested in the mother. Um, make sure you're muting you yourself. Um, one second. All right. All right, perfect. Um, so we'll continue this one because you'll see the reaction and how she plays. Now she has a contact with her mother, beginning to show a little interest in the environment. And shortly, she'll be right back with the toy. So you would call this a security? Yes. Yeah. She's certainly much happier. So basically, after the after the mother comes back, oh, one second here. Um, I'm just going to mute everyone. Just yeah, there we go. All right. Sorry about that. All right. So, yeah. So with this one, you see she basically, she gets sad when the mom leaves and she has a little bit of a tough time. And then when the mom comes back, um, she's able to play again. So it's the reaction that she has when she comes back that shows you the secure because like she's okay. Now we're going to go to the next part of the video. Let's see. Here's the next one. Then she sits in the chair holding the baby. The baby's still sullen. This is after the the mom left the baby. I think it's the mom or the caregiver. And this is the reaction of the baby afterward. He's he's low keyed. So you would call this insecure? Yes, insecure. He's avoidant. He's, He's not engaging her. And it's not being, the reunion's not effective. And it's important to remember here that the thing that you see how the child is reacting, the mom basically um, 
comes back in the room and the child's head's down and they're not, he's not like looking at the mother, like avoidance. And then the next one. So insecure, but you'll see, we get a look at his play before the separation. The mother's left. And when she returns, she picks him up. He can't calm down. He's still upset. She offers a toy to amuse him or to comfort him or to distract him, and he slaps it away. She offers another. He slaps it away. He's angry. He's, he's, we call these babies resistant or ambivalent because they both want her back. So with this one, this would be anxious, preoccupied. So the reaction is basically the mom comes back. The child still can't play because, and, and notice how the child's kind of clinging to the mother. So, um, okay, and then now we're going to do another video, and this one I put in here because I don't know, um, I don't know how many people, um, know about, um, sorry, emotional neglect, um, but I put this in because this is basically what happens when a child bids for connection, but then the mother doesn't look towards the child and kind of ignores the child and what can happen to the child. They did this as an experiment. So obviously like the child got the connection, but, and it, and obviously it happens over time. It's not something that happens just one time. So. Mother and the baby engaging in cooing and smiling. And then they ask the mother to basically put on a blank face and not respond at all. When a baby is not attended to, that is a sign of danger to the baby biologically. So the stress systems become activated. Okay. In a brain that is constantly bathed in stress hormones, not this up and down that comes with normal development, certain key synapses, the connections between nerves fail to form and critical regions of the brain. So neglect, both fails to provide the stimulation that's needed to develop the basic architecture. And so you see this one is an example of, let's say a child wants connection and then the, the mother or the caregiver isn't for some reason able to connect, isn't able to attune to the child. And that's some of the basis of like emotional neglect. Um, and then I only have, I have two more videos. This one, I, I, I love, Watching. Wait, Sarah. Yeah. What style? What um, what do you call that with the emotional neglect? Um, some people say that people that are more dismissive avoidant have it, but I think also fearful avoidant can have it. Anxious preoccupied, they often get some connection, but it's inconsistent, so they don't know when they're going to get it. Essentially. Um, so I think it, it can apply to all three insecure attachments. Um, but emotional neglect, um, a good author to look into in a good book, it's John S. Webb. I can put it in the chat. Um, she wrote a book called Running on Empty. Um, it can happen to even a family that, let's say they're healthy and they're meeting their kids' physical needs and from the outside, it seems fine, but let's say the child has, they're feeling angry. And for some reason, the the parent doesn't like when the child feels angry and has trouble kind of um, helping them through it. And so maybe they dismiss it, right? So it could be little moments of dismissal. Um, but yeah, she really describes it very well in the book. Um, let me write it in the chat. And this one, this video I like, this is about monkeys. And remember back to Gabriel Mate, the quote in the beginning. Inside a warm, familiar mother of cloth is a stark wire doll set up as nothing more than a feeding machine.
The young monkey is placed deliberately on a cloth mother which has no milk to nourish him, but fulfills some fundamental needs. This experiment revolves around one simple question. Will the infant monkey switch his affection to a wire mother which offers food and life itself? Only when forced by hunger does he loosen his grip. And so with this, you see how the monkey, first of all, the monkey doesn't even want to leave the person. This experiment, I think, was done a long time ago, like I think in the 1970s, but I'm not, don't quote me on it. Um, but, um, and I feel like it's a really hard experiment for the monkeys themselves. But um, anyways, it does show you that they prefer the cloth one over the one with the food. Um, the other thing that I um, also rang to be true was they had this thing, I heard it a while back ago, where they had the study of uh, orphanage and they were taking care of the infant babies, but they only met their physical needs. And in these babies, they often like died or they got sick and they were meeting their physical needs, but they weren't meeting their need for touch. Um, their need for connection. Um, and so the point is, this is just as important as the food and physical health. And if you notice the monkeys, they pick the one that resembles the mother rather than the food. And the, in the experiment, the monkeys do go to the wire one to get fed, but then they go back to the this one as soon as they have their food. And here's another video. This is the last one. So um, this one is about touch. And this is Gabriel Mate. He's really um, influential with attachment and also trauma, like healing. And this is just a short clip here. And as I'm talking to them at the, at the newborn visit, they'll be massaging their babies. And I'll be asking them, what are you doing? Said, oh, we're doing baby massage. This is traditionally done in India. And those babies are in total bliss. You know, and the mother's talking to me about kneading the baby and, you know, touching them. Now, there's a book uh, by the British anthropologist Ashley Montague called Skin, The Human Significance of Touch, that shows the importance of physical contact uh, for babies, skin-to-skin -skin contact, which, by the way, is why breastfeeding is so important. It's not just a transmission of nutritional goods to the baby's intestines. It's also the physical touch that matters so much, which is very different from the average bottle-fed situation. In any case, the, that close physical contact with the baby uh, not only benefits the baby, and we know that it does, it promotes brain development and release of hormones and all that, but it also releases um, bonding hormones in the mother, and it helps to trigger her own mothering instincts. So, as you see, um, again, it changes the brain. So that's the one thing that they have in there that I can change the brain. Um, I go back to the PowerPoint here. So any questions or any comments about what we just saw for the videos? It was really helpful to see the videos. So thank you. Oh yeah, thank you. I'm glad I glad I'm glad you liked them. Um yeah. What 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 kind of stood out to you? Well, I also just noticed my mom had done a lot of massages on my nieces when they were born and she's from India. So I was not I was kind of wondering why she always gave them little massages when they went to sleep. Nice. Yeah, that was interesting. Yeah, yeah. I know, touch is important. Um, and if we don't, sometimes if you're avoiding connection, you might actually avoid touch. Um, yeah. Anyone else before I go on? All right. Well, now we're going to dive into the attachment styles and we're going to learn more about it. So... The first one 
anxious preoccupied. So I'm doing it based on like characteristics. So um, we'll go over the characteristics and um, and then from there, you can let me know what attachment style you think you are. Um, so the first one is anxious preoccupied. Um, I put the telephone there because oftentimes people that are anxious, if they don't hear back, let's say they text someone and they don't hear back, or they called someone and they're not answering, they might get really anxious and might be like, why is this person not answering? Think back to that little guess the attachment style thing that we did. Um, and they might be like, is it me? Do they not want me? Am I not good enough? Like all that stuff could come in their head if they are extremely anxious, preoccupied. Um, remember, this is all not cut in stone too. So, but in, just in general. So characteristics, they tend to be very kind, attentive, warm, likable, friendly. Um, that's because they focus on other people. They oftentimes will get connection with other people and not necessarily be connected to themselves. They focus on connection because it makes them feel safe to connect to other people. Um, and they're the ones who can also move quickly in relationships. They might, you might get in a relationship with them and within like less than a week, they're like, um, I had one person that I think in 10 minutes, he was like, I love you. This is like three years ago. Um, so they can move really quickly. Um, they can be like, oh, this is my partner kind of thing really fast. Um, you also like emotional problems. They might feel lonely. They might feel insecure, anxiety, fearful worry, desperation, even sad needs. They have a high need for love, intimacy, closeness, connection, validation, approval, certainty, community, family. So these are the people that might be really focused on family. Now, not to say that secures are definitely focused on family. And also we have something called like personality needs too as well. So, um, but anyway, um, they, they value closeness. They want to get close to people. They want to connect. Although if someone is really anxious, preoccupied, they might be in a relationship with someone who's dismissive avoidant, who wants to avoid closeness, which actually signals that maybe the person who's anxious, preoccupied might actually have trouble accepting closeness because they're with someone who doesn't want to be close to them, if that makes sense. Core wounds. So core wounds are like negative beliefs that you have about yourself. Um, and I will have um, I will have a workshop about like the core wounds and changing negative beliefs um, in the future. But um, for now, theirs is abandonment, like being afraid that someone will abandon them. Um, rejection, I'm not good enough, like something's wrong with me kind of thing. Feeling unsafe, um, unloved, excluded, disliked. Um, their boundaries, they can often ignore their boundaries. They they want to get close to people. So rather than sticking up for themselves or saying when something, they kind of tolerate behavior that is not technically acceptable to them. And in that, they'll kind of betray themselves sort of. But again, this is in the, the most intense. So um, coping mechanisms. Um, can get clingy, can be seeking validation, seeking approval, seeking attention. They might be fawning. Um, it can be the codependent kind of stuff. Um, yeah. Um, sorry. I was just seeing. I, okay. There we go. All right. So um, yeah, codependency, neediness. Testing. Testing is like this idea like, hey, do you love me? like, like over testing it or sometimes getting angry at someone to get connection. Expectations, they might, they, they might want their partner to meet all their needs and know exactly what they need without telling them. Like, you should know what I need and you should meet them at all times. That obviously is a, at the more extreme. And then we have dismissive avoidance. Um, okay, there's someone. Please make sure you're on mute. Oh, one sec. Oh, Don, one second. Let me see. Um, are you able to mute yourself? Hi. 
Um, dismissive avoidant. So characteristics, they're often logical. One second here. Let's make sure everyone mute. Here we go. All right. They're often logical, practical, grounded, rational, slow to warm up, guarded, might feel disconnected from their emotions. They may not, they might kind of stuff them down. Um, these are the people that they can take charge of things. And they're not really focused on relationships so much as they're focused on the task or how to have the solution of things. Um, emotional problems, they might have a lot of shame, low level anxiety, irritation, impatience, frustration, annoyance. Um, oftentimes they have the I am defective core wound. Um, I am weak, and which is about the shame kind of stuff. Their needs, often they want autonomy, freedom, appreciation. They want space. They want time to decompress, certainty, harmony. They want everything to be all right in the relationship. They And they also want like everyone to kind of meet their own needs. Um, I meet my needs, you meet yours, so to speak. Core wounds, I am defective, I'm unsafe, I am trapped, I'm incapable of change. This is often the the worst, the hardest one for them is that they don't believe they can change. And so they kind of get stuck. Um, they also, again, they, they work so hard to repress things that they kind of stay like that. Um, weak, not good enough, helpless, powerless. Boundaries often have hard walls, like, either yes or no, like not in between. Like, let's say they they don't feel like having a, they, let's say they have a girlfriend and they're kind of tired. Rather than saying, hey, can we hang out, but just kind of do our own thing? They'll be like, no, I can't hang out at all. You know, rather than having like a gradual thing in between. Um, coping mechanisms, often like withdrawing, stonewalling, dismissing, sometimes passive aggressiveness, um, numbing, avoiding creature comforts. Again, like I said, this is, you know, it's not one shoe fits all for everyone. Um, creature comforts are like being on the phone too much or um, playing games or maybe working um, or um, watching TV, that kind of stuff. Expectations, they, they expect to have space. Um, no conflict ever, no no compromises. Um, my partner should meet all their needs and I will meet mine. And again, these are at the, these are at the extreme. And then the next one we have is fearful avoided. Characteristics, they often are very present. They can be hyper vigilant. So if you are fearful avoidant, um, you might be really paying attention to your environment, to the other people, to yourself. Um, you might, um, you you might be charming, likable, intense sometimes, hot, cold, hot, cold, as in like one moment you want connection, the next moment you don't. And it can be confusing to people because they're like, what do you want? Kind of thing. Um, suspicious. Suspicious is based on, the uh, you know, believing that people might betray you or that they're going to lie to you or they're going to let you down. Um, emotional problems. Sometimes they can be angry, hurt, frustrated, guilty, pressured, overwhelmed, anxious, offended. Um, oftentimes people that are fearful of what it might have a lot of like, um, like kind of trauma in the way sort of, but I think all these can actually have trauma. Um, they have needs for emotional depth, passion, trust, presence, presence safety, novelty, as um, a lot of people that are fearful of what it really like novelty, like change, be able to kind of do kind of things. Sometimes people that are fearful of what it might be risk takers, um, like in growth, freedom, emotional depth. They often want emotional depth. Um, maybe they didn't get it as a kid. And so they seek it outside. And notice when a lot of times if there's something you're really, really seeking, it might be because it wasn't met during childhood. Boundaries. So fearful avoidance can say, oh, I'm good at boundaries. But a lot of times um, they might set boundaries based on like anger or they feel hurt, right? So um, they can often abandon their boundaries to get closeness. 
So, and then they get close in this connection, but then they get frustrated. Maybe they feel like, oh, I'm being taken advantage of. And then all of a sudden they lash out. They kind of like get angry and then they set a really hard boundary. This is like, you know, maybe you unfriend someone at the hardest, right? Um, and um, and then of course they feel guilty and then it goes into a cycle and then they do the whole thing all over again. This is again at the extreme. Coping mechanisms, testing, withdrawal, stonewalling, criticism, spitefulness, vitality, um, creature comforts. Um, and also I would put like fight, flight, freeze, fawn. Again, the PTSD, CPTSD, so to speak, complex PTSD. Expectations, no one should ever break their trust. No line ever. So they have to, often like their biggest core wound is betrayal that someone is going to betray them, someone is going to lie to them, someone is going to let them down. And then we have secure attachment. So secure attachment characteristics, stable, emotionally balanced, um, able to communicate their needs, um, and they're able to do it in like a respectful way, a positive way, um, without kind of like blaming the other person, essentially, um, especially when we're heated, it's really hard to do that. Um, healthy self-esteem, they know how to set boundaries, they know like what's okay for them and what's not, and then they know how to set them and then keep them, because that's another element of boundaries is you can see you have a boundary, but then if you like don't keep up, keep to your word, right, um, or you're not consistent, um, they're able to be consistent, patient, steady, accountable, um, needs, they have needs for balance, harmony, peace, connection, consistency, commitment, accountability. Core wounds. Um, so core wounds for them are based on a specific situation. An example, let's say you're doing really bad in school. Um, they might feel like, oh, I'm not good enough. But it's based off of the event, the situation, rather based off of like, oh, this is a core wound I have and it applies to, and it was created during childhood. Um, they often have less negative emotions. They still obviously experience like grief, hurt, fear, sadness, anger, et cetera, but they don't have as many. It's kind of like um, people that are more um, insecure attachment might be in a minefield, right? And like you have to kind of step over the minefield and there's so many mines. Well, people that are more secure have less of those mines. They don't have to worry. And maybe they're in a whole nother field. You know, they're no longer in the minefield. Um Coping mechanisms, um, often they're able to do conflict resolution, communication, vulnerability, self-soothing, understanding needs, asking for support. Um, so that is the basis of um, the, the different attachment styles. Um, so Don, you say that you're, um, you feel like you're anxious preoccupied. Um, you guys can either do in chat or if you want to speak out, like, um, what, what do you think you are? And I have a little, I have another sheet too, as well, we can do. Yeah. Anxious, anxious, preoccupied. Yeah. Anyone think they're fearful, avoidant or dismissive or secure? You can also be a combination too, as well. And I do have an attachment quiz. So I'll put that in here. That's from the personal development school. Um, I do have another sheet that we can do here. So let me pull it up. I thought this would be fun because here, here's another way to look at attachment. So the secure attachment, they're often um, satisfied in relationships. Um, let me see, okay, here we go. Um, they see parent as secure figure and lays the foundation in which the individual can go out and explore the world. So like they, like if they're a parent, for example, their child will feel safe to explore the world, right? Um, and they themselves also felt safe if they were secure to begin with rather than earn secure, right? Um, they feel safe and connected to their adult partner. 
They feel safe to rely on others and comfortable with others relying on them. Um, they can offer support and love to an another. They, it's, they feel safe to be intimate and open to their partner, emotionally, mentally, physically. Um, trust and harmony, ability to work through conflict in a constructive ma manner. So they're able to like resolve conflict. Um, I know for a while I used to think conflict was scary um, and that it meant like the end of the relationship. But um, there's another idea that conflict can also, when both partners kind of work together, um, you can kind of resolve things, right? And you can actually get closer to the other person. Um, and then anxious, preoccupied, um, constantly desiring more and more connection, likely to form a fantasy bond in relationships. This is where we get, um, uh, you have the codependency, but you also have the love addiction kind of stuff, right? Um, willing to self-abandon in order to connect with others. They might um, since I was more, um, anxious, preoccupied, I was fearful, wouldn't lean in AP. Um, at one time I would make friends and I would try to fit in with the friends and I would kind of ignore what I liked. So, um, that's like an example of self-abandonment. Like you're, you're not doing what, what makes you happy, you know, what fulfills you. Um, and maybe you don't even know who you are because you're hanging out with someone and you kind of mold into like whatever they're doing or how they're acting. Right. Um, cling to their partner and attempt to derive safety, deeply fear abandonment and often avoid spending time alone. They wanna be with someone at all times. Um, people pleasing, this is where you get the fawning and that kind of stuff, codependency again. Um, out of touch with their own feelings and needs. They might know what the other person's feelings and needs are, but maybe not their own. I used to, when I was healing, I used to catch myself where I would feel a certain emotion um, and I would notice that the other person felt a different way. And suddenly in my head, it'd be like, oh, they feel like this. Oh, I must feel like that instead. Like I caught it, like when I was in the, the healing thing. So, and then fearful avoidant, um, afraid of abandonment while also fearing too much closeness in relationships, swing between fear of abandonment and fear of needing to rely on others in an ambivalent manner. So dismissive avoidance, they tend to gradually deactivate versus someone who's fearful avoidant. Um, they could go hot, cold, like switch, like really fast. They can deactivate really fast. They can turn back on really fast. Um, so it can be really fast. <laughs> um, can be overwhelmed by their own emotions and express volatil volatility in the relationships. Not all fearful avoidance um, have the lashing out, but some do. Um, will often feel confused and exhausted in their relationships as relationships bring many of their triggers and fears to light. So they might feel really happy at first, but then all of a sudden their fears come alive, um, even in the beginning, like the dating stage and whatnot. Um, crave for depth of connection and fear it and distrust at the same time. So like they want connection, but they also avoid it. Many highs and lows in relationships. So again, think of that roller coaster. You can also get the roller coaster when you're in, uh, I don't know if you've heard of the anxious avoidant trap or like the roller coaster thing. Sometimes the anxious preoccupied can get in a thing with dismissive avoidance and often can have a roller coaster thing going on as well there. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Dawn. So you're anxious preoccupied. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then the last one here is Dismissive avoidance. So desire to maintain distance from partner and avoid vulnerability. Self-oriented perspective, believing that everyone is completely responsible for self and shouldn't rely on others. So again, like I do my thing, you do my yours. We don't connect in, in the middle there. Um, get needs met for creature comforts. So oftentimes it might seem like they're kind of connecting to themselves or they seem more secure but not necessarily, they might be avoiding their feelings. Like they seem more calm, but they're, it's, they could be avoiding. Um, and they fear relying on others. That's a big one. Um, getting, they're out of touch with their own emotions. They don't really know how they feel. They, they avoid emotions. They push them down. Um, they might also intellectualize their emotions. Like rather than feeling it in their body, like somatically, they, they might, they might say, oh, like, I feel like this, but it might not actually, they might not really feel it in their body, if that makes sense. 
um, able to com um, compartmentalize and internalize feelings for prolonged uh, periods of time. This basically means that, you know, pushing it down. May fall blind. So people that are avoidant might be looking for things that are wrong with their partner. Um, versus people that are anxious preoccupied, leaning more anxious preoccupied, might be looking for things that are wrong with them and trying to fix themselves rather than seeing their partner. So the 50-50 is kind of skewed. Um, and they do this fault lining for, for self-protection. Because again, remember, people that are dismissive avoidant, um, connection felt very unsafe for them. And so they technically sort of avoid it. Versus people that are more anxious preoccupied, they were able to get some connection but it wasn't consistent. So yeah, do we have any updates on attachment styles? So. And the next thing I have that would be fun if you guys wanna do, um, this is common expectations in relationships. So we can just do a few, but I'm gonna read one. And if you can write in the chat, what a, what attachment style you think it is. You can put, if you want to put for sh for uh, short, you can put AP for anxious preoccupied. You can put um, SE for secure, um, DA for dismissive avoidant, and FA for fearful avoidant. So for this statement, what attachment style do you think it is? My partner should constantly shower me with affection. Who do you think would be having that one? Yeah, yeah, for sure, AP, yeah, uh-huh, let's see, mm-hmm, let's go to number three, my partner should know that I need space, yeah, yeah, my partner should know that I need space, yeah, 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 dismissive avoidant. Yeah. Um, let's do number six. My partner should never be late. What do you think that one would be? Yeah, yeah, it could be AP, yeah. Um, it also could be fearful avoidant. Um, I would put it as fearful avoidance because fearful avoidance have a big betrayal wound. And I think being light um, could be a betrayal, but it also could be AP because um, they want consistency. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's do a few more. Um, number eight, my partner should want to communicate as often as I do. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, AP. Yeah, anxious preoccupied. Um number 11. My partner should split the chores around the house with me. This could be anyone maybe. <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, that one might be a trick question because um, that could be based on how you believe a relationship should function, right? So it could apply to all four essentially. Because um, I've, I'm sure there's probably some dismissive avoidance that are not tidy, right? And some that are, and then there could be APs that are not tidy, and same with secure. Yeah. Um. Here's one. Number 12, my partner should always plan a date night. You think secure? Yeah, I guess you can have a date night. I think that could also be, again, it could go into different ones. I would maybe say AP would probably want more of a date night just because they want connection. Um, but yeah, secure also could, yeah. 
Yeah. Um, here's one. Number 14. My partner should prioritize my needs over their own. <laughs> yeah, we got a few answers here. Um, I would say anxious preoccupied because they expect, they unconsciously expect others to take care of their needs um, versus a DA wants to like meet their own needs and they, they often might have trouble asking for help. Um, again, this is not all set in stone. People can have many different traits based on how you grew up. So yeah. Um, <laughs> the selfish. Um, but can I ask a question on that then? Because mm -hmm. I thought with the anxious preoccupied, there were people pleasing. So I thought that they're putting the other person's needs first. So are they expecting the other person to be putting their needs? So their yeah, they, there is often people pleasing and fawning. You're okay. right. Um. It's almost like I do this for you. I expect you to do it back for me. Oh, okay. That makes sense. And also I think people that are more anxious, preoccupied, um, they, they often, yeah, yeah, Don. Mm -hmm. um, people that are more anxious, preoccupied, they might also, what was I going to say? So um, I can't remember what I was going to say, but yeah, yeah. Um, Thank you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And also these could be based on too, like how you are too. It's not all set in stone, but yeah. Um, let's see, let's do maybe two more. Let's see, here we go. Number 18, my partner should never hurt my feelings even accidentally. Yeah. Yeah. Don. Yeah. Cause yeah, sometimes you're right. So yeah, it's unconscious too. Um, oh, and I, I know what I was going to say about anxious preoccupied. So a lot of times they're getting their needs for validation and connection from their partner. Um, and they might, they might kind of ignore who they are. Um, they might try to fit in. They might like the people pleasing, think about when you're people pleasing or fawning, you might not be paying attention to your own needs and wants. And so um, you might be getting your need for connection. Think about Gabriel Mate, where he says, this trumps another thing. So they might have some maladaptive ways of meeting their need for connection or validation. Maybe they ask for approval from their partner. Um, I know I used to ask for approval. <laughs> like I would be painting, like this is three years ago. And I would ask my, my, my partner, be like, hey, um, is this good? And then they would give their opinion and I didn't believe it. Like I didn't, it wasn't good for me, right? Like, so they're telling me techniques. Like, it was almost like I believed I wasn't doing good enough as an artist. And here I was asking someone out. And so I was basically denying my own, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So essentially you can also, you can also be getting a need for connection, right? By the people pleasing, people pleasing, think about it. When you're people pleasing and fawning, what need is it making, meeting? Like it's meeting a need for connection, right? To feel safe. But in doing that, you might also be betraying yourself. Yeah. 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 Train that. Yeah. Here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then um, let me see. So oh, and then the last thing I wanted to go over in here before we go over the rest of it. Um, let me change my share here. Okay, so this was also I wanted to share this really quick too, because this is a I don't know if anyone has ever seen this chart before. Um, I saw it through, I think it was Brianna McWilliams. She does attachment stuff. Um, yeah, so do you guys want to talk about that in a little bit? We can definitely talk more about some of this stuff. Um, we will do more questions. Um, 
I want to stop caring. Yeah. 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 We can definitely talk more about that. Um, there will be definitely time for more questions and we can have a discussion if you want to. Um, yeah. So this is basically a chart here. Um, people can be in different parts. So someone who's anxious, preoccupied, if they're high, they might be like in the very corner. They might have high, like, and notice like this is high trust, low avoidance, high anxiety, low esteem. So they might have like high anxiety and low self-esteem if they're in the very corner. Um, and then versus someone who's secure would be in this one. And then avoidant. So avoidant might seem like they have high self-esteem and low anxiety. Um, but maybe they have high avoidance, right? Um, and they have low trust in other people, essentially. Um, and then fearful avoidance, they can have a trust issue themselves, right? The betrayal wound, when they feel that other people are going to betray them, they also probably don't trust themselves. So sometimes it's shadows within. So what is outside is also maybe inside. There's a possibility of that. Um, um, they might have high avoidance, they might have high anxiety, and you can go in between, like you can move, maybe you're this part, you're in a different part of it. Um, I thought this was really interesting when I first um, saw this. So yeah, um, so the last part is basically, um, I have a bunch of resources and books. So um, I will put it in the chat again, but um, I have a survey. Um, and yeah, so if you do the survey, you can get, and you don't have to really answer all of it. If, as long as you just fill out the last part, that's the easiest way for me to get your email and your name. And then I can send you the, the slides and I can also send you the video. So some books here, um, John Gottman books are really good. John Gottman Institute. He does, um, what is it? The seven, seven rules for a happy marriage. I think that's the name of the book. There's also attached, his book is okay. Um, I think he goes a little bit, um, some books can kind of put down dismissive avoidance. And I think he goes into that a little bit. Um, and then Wired for Love, Stan Tekken is really good. His books are really good. Um, he's basically about the couple bubble, this idea of working together as a couple, but you also have to have a partner that um, is willing to be with you and work with you. And then Attachment Theory by um, Thais Gibson. She's the one who does the personal development school. And that's where I got my certification. Um, I actually haven't read her book, although I need to. Um, um, podcasts, some very good podcasts. Like, as you can see, like the Confidence Podcast. Like, these are various people that do stuff about attachment. Ricky and Jimmy on relationships was really good. Um, and then if you're on Instagram, um, Self Love Rainbow. Dr. Minji, she does perfectionism. There's also people that do complex PTSD. They do more of a therapy kind of stuff. Um, the secure relationship, that is a very nice one to follow, especially if you're interested in um, learning about attachment styles because that's all about attachment. Anxious heart guide is for people that are more AP, um, but you also have the loving avoidant, which also goes to the avoidant side. Um, you And then YouTube, you have a bunch of different stuff like personal development school. Thais's work is really good. She does a lot. She focuses on attachment theory. Um, therapy in a nutshell. Um, crappy childhood theory. Oh, yeah. Secure relationship. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, crappy childhood theory. Um, she does like complex PTSD. Um, Coach Court, he's pretty good. Tracy, like all these different people, they do... Um, Douglas Blotch, I put him on because he does like depression and anxiety um, for people that have those kind of things. Um, and then Charisma and Command is just a fun one because if you're interested in charisma and how to develop it and, and like kind of work through stuff, um, if you're more introvert. <laughs> um, and then other ones, um, Somatic Experiencing International, that's like Peter Levine stuff, like somatic stuff in the body. Um Gabriel Mate, Peter, Pete Walker, he does a book on PTSD. Christian Neff, her book is really good read. She also has um, a TED talk on self-compassion. So if you're working on gaining more self-compassion towards yourself, she talks about the three pillars. Um, if you're working on how to communicate better, nonviolent communication is a really good book. He, it teaches you how not to blame the other person, 
how to take accountability for an example. This person did this. I felt, uh, maybe I felt worried because I'm making it mean, like he does in that kind of format. Um, and then there's boundaries, the running on empty. PMLD is really good for those that are working through love addiction, codependency. Um, yeah. And then last, um, I will I will put the list. Um, if you're not part of the meetup, I definitely suggest um, joining the meetup just because that's where I'm posting most of my stuff. I will be doing more workshops. I, Like I said, I do worksheets and I eventually want to start doing some free stuff with my worksheets where you'll do a worksheet with me, like a very simple one um, as a group. And I also do every two weeks, I do um, ask the coach where you can get coaching advice and other workshops that I want to do is one, like I said, belief reprogramming. Yeah. And then, um, and then emotional um, regulation. Um, and also if you're interested in coaching, there's, if you do the survey, you can get a free thing or a worksheet. So let me put that link in here too. Um, Okay. okay. I so that's basically the end. Oh yeah, sorry, the two workshops. Yeah, so I want to do um it's probably going to be in a month from now. That's why I definitely suggest doing I'm glad you found it helpful, Patty. Um so yeah, so the two workshops I plan on doing in probably a month from now, I will do a belief reprogramming. So you'll learn more about the core wounds and how to like reprogram your core wounds and beliefs, so to speak. And then I also want to do one on emotional regulation and emotional intelligence that kind of goes into the somatic stuff a little bit. Um, I will probably redo the attachment one. Eventually, some of these workshops I probably will have paid. Um, but for now, I'm doing them for free. Um, and same with my worksheets. So I have some worksheets that I will do for free, but some of them, I have a really nice somatic one that's like 31 pages. That one will definitely cost money. So like I'll have some tiers. Um, and also, like I said, I have a lot of free stuff, but you're welcome to like try out coaching with me. Um, we do, I have a 12 week program that I do. Um, that basically goes through boundaries. It goes through um, learning more about your attachment styles, um, how to communicate better, um, learning about what your needs are, right? Um, what you're about, yeah. So it goes into all that so stuff. Yeah, I'm glad you liked it. Yeah. I'm glad, I'm glad you did. Yeah, thank you. Do you, um, anyone have any questions? Um, we can either end early or if you guys want to do some coaching, live coaching, you can as well. Um, can you share a little bit more about the 12 week workshop, the time yeah. of it and what it, what it is here? Is it a group or is it a online or just a little more about it? Yeah, sure. Sure. I actually have a sheet. So let me pull that up. And I, I realized I probably need to learn how to mute everyone. So I realized, um, so let me see. So, okay. So, oh yeah, I have a really cool attachment sheet too that has all this information in it too. So I definitely suggest doing the survey, even if you just do your email, your contact, or at least join in the meetup group. Um, at the moment, I don't have, I'm still learning how to, like you guys are one of the first people that I'm doing this with. So I'm bear with me. I'm learning how to do all this, but um, so that's the easiest way for me to give you the materials if you want the, especially if you want the video of this, and you want um, the the PowerPoint. All right. So let me see. Sorry. Oh, here it is. Yeah. So I basically am certified in integrated attachment theory. So for the last year, I've been coaching people mostly in relationships 
And I've been, we go through a six, it's, it's like a, there's six elements into the program. And it starts with these like discovery questions, which you can do online. And then maybe the first week we go over it. Um, and it's a 12 week program. I often have people, I currently have someone that I'm working with that started the 12 week program and she's still working with me um, because she's finding it very helpful. Um, so anyway, breakdown, you talk about, we talk about the core wounds, um, the belief patterns. So you learn to identify what your negative core wounds are and how to reprogram them. Um, because oftentimes you have something happen, you get like really upset about something and it's like an over emotional reaction, right? And you're like, what is this about? Like you ask yourself, what in, what am I making this mean about me? Right. And so you learn how to do that. Um, needs and relationship expectations. So how do you interact with others? And what is your relationship to yourself? How do you connect to yourself and others? Um, and you learn to how to identify your needs and how well you're meeting them. And also what you expect from other people. Some people want more connections, some people want less. An example, you want to make friends with someone, right? Maybe you expect them to meet once a week, right? For coffee or something. Well, maybe they only expect to meet like once a month, right? So people have different expectations. Emotional patterns. You learn how to identify your emotional tendencies. You're kind of like the mental too as well. Um, in your to your relationship to yourself, to others, to other, to your environment, to events in your life, right? Um, and then you learn to catch your stories. So, like when something happens, and you're like, "Oh, this person's like they're doing this on purpose. Um, they must not like me." So catch yourself. Be like, "Is this a story? Is this one hundred percent true? Could the opposite have been true? Maybe, maybe they're not texting you back right away." Um, have I ever not text someone back right away? You ask yourself, have I not done this? Have I done that same behavior toward, you know, towards another person? And what were my reasons? Oh, I was busy. I was with my kids. Um, so it kind of helps you to kind of get out of that. Um, relationship to boundaries. Are you able to identify your boundaries? Are you able to implement them? Are you able to keep them? Um, how are your boundaries to yourself? You know, how do you keep your emotional boundaries to yourself? to others, time boundaries, physical boundaries. There's many different types of boundaries. Communication patterns, how are you communicating? Is it passive aggressiveness? Are you aggressive? Are you not communicating? You know, are you ignoring your, your, your needs essentially? Um, are you doing it in a healthy way? Um, then behavioral coping mechanisms. Um, again, if you have codependency, people pleasing, um, how can you update those behaviors? Like what needs are those make, meeting? And then how can you update them? Can you find a healthier way to meet your needs? Um, or maybe you're ruminating about something. Well, what need is this meeting? What would you like to do instead? And so, yeah, it's a 12 week program as you see here. Um, and it's broken down, but I also do it based on what you need. Like I have one client right now who needs more belief reprogramming because she's working on anxiety. So we we do a little bit of less of the needs and stuff. So it depends on who it is. And this is just another little sheet there. Um, and then this is the BTEA. So one of the tools that I teach people is BTEA, which is your beliefs, your thoughts, your emotions, your actions. They kind of all kind of influence each other. So when you are really upset, one thing you can do as a really quick tip is you can ask yourself, what am I thinking about this? What are my thoughts? How am I feeling? What, what are my beliefs? You know, am I feeling not good enough? Am I feeling ignored? Am I, you know, like, what are your beliefs in that situation? Or I'm not good enough, or I'm defective, or I'm stupid, right? And then what actions are you taking? Like, oh, I'm, I'm avoiding this person because I don't feel good. Or maybe I'm speaking too much. And then you can ask yourself too, like what actions would you like to take instead? And then um, also the program goes into the six basic human needs. Um, so we have six basic human needs. Oftentimes, if you were neglected, if you are like more insecure attachment, um, you might have one or two that kind of stick out because they weren't met in childhood. So you have growth, you know, and then you have contribution. 
significance, which is validation. Uncertainty, that's the need for change. People that like adventure, that kind of stuff, right? Love and connection. So family connection with people. And certainty, to feel safe. Um, oftentimes people that are AP, they have a high need for certainty. Um, high need for significance, love and connection. Um, people that are more fearful, avoidant, might have this, they might, depending on where they lean, um, love and connection, they might have uncertainty. That's the novelty and growth, right? People that are DA, they still want, I think they still want certainty because they want harmony in relationships. Um, so it depends on who you are, so to speak. Um, and then there's also seven areas of life. Um, you can see like career, financial. I don't want to go too much into it unless you guys want me to. Um, mental, emotional, physical, spiritual relationships. And then there's six dating stages. So again, if you were to do coaching with me, um, we would go in, you, especially if it's a relationship, we would we can talk about the relationship. A lot of times, um, a, a little thing is people end up, a lot of times people break up in the power struggle stage. Sometimes they could be together for 20 years, 10 years, and they haven't gone beyond the power struggle because one partner might not, like they might avoid their needs, right? Um, and so they can often break up here. Um, honeymoons, that's where you feel like all lovey, both partners, everything's good, right? Dating, you're kind of venting the other person, um, whether they're a good match, whether you're a good match for them, et cetera. Um, power struggles where like you have more conflict. Um, it can be challenging, less intimacy, feeling less disconnected. Sometimes you can you can fluctuate between one stage and another. You can feel a little bit more stable with your partner, and then you could go back into the power struggle and so on. But it ends with you feeling more committed and bliss, where you're like more, you know, family, that kind of stuff. And you feel good with your partner. You know them very well. So knowing them authentically. So, yeah, hope that answers your question. I might have went. No, that was that was great. I you skipped over one real quick. Was that uh -huh. one? what one was that? It was just one. before this one. The one just before the last one. All right, one second. Mm -hmm. The seven areas of life. Yes, yes, yeah. I was just um, yeah wanting to look at it for another minute. So oh, for sure. Financial, mental. So yeah, the career. So you have seven areas of life. So <laughs> I just want to make sure. Yeah. I didn't know if people were interested or not. So um, yeah. So seven areas of life, you have career. Um, that's basically like what you're doing in life, right? What you're working on, but like, it's also like having a career that makes you happy, right? That you're passionate about, that it adds meaning, you know, contribution maybe to society. Um, financial, how well you handle your finances, um, budgeting, savings, that retirement, how you spend your money, right? Mental, that's your interests, your skills. Like think about how you're learning, like things like if you like learning, that's mental. Um, creative expression, general intelligence, um, how open you are to new ideas and challenges. And then you have emotional, your overall happiness in life, yourself, how you respond to external stimuli, how you feel about yourself and others. So an example, let's say you get really upset. How do you act? Like people that are very, very fearful of winning might, they might have a lot of emotional, I call it emotional tornadoes or hurricanes where they like have this huge emotional reaction. Like how, how much are you able to regulate your emotions? Right. Um, and to kind of like sort of stay out, but kind of work through them and stay in your body. Um, then you have physical. So this is like your health, your fitness, how you're eating, activities. Um, it can also be your fun, like recreation, how you're relaxing, right? Spiritual, it could be like if you go to church and all that stuff, but it, and it could be like spiritual as in like you believe in the world, but it could also be nature, it could be how you view yourself in the world. So it doesn't have to necessarily be the spiritual as, you know, like, oh, there's a there's a being out there, right? Um, it can be prayer, reading, meditation, that kind of stuff. How you, how you view yourself in the world, your beliefs about the world. 
Um, and then there's relationships. So your relationship with your family, your friends, neighbors, coworkers, romantic relationships. So those are the seven areas of life. And what we do is um, we do something called auto suggestion. Actually, I think that she is the last one here. Um, we do something called auto suggestion, which I will do when I do the beliefs workshop. I will talk a little bit about this. Um, and actually, I'll talk a little bit now. But auto suggestion is basically how you reprogram those negative core wounds. So really quick, these are the negative core wounds right here. Um, I am not enough. I am bad. I'm stupid. I don't belong. I don't matter. I'm disliked, excluded, disconnected, rejected, unloved. You see all these, like an example, like really quick. Um, I, someone wanted to go back. Trina, you, do you still want to go back to the first one? Sorry. I just saw that. Like the first sheet. Yeah. I could go back to that in a second. Um, fill out the survey and get the slides that way. I, I don't want. I can fill out the survey and do it that way. Get the slides that way. Are, are oh. these slides that you'll share? In the, in yeah, the, I, I will share it. Like if I get your email and yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I don't need to load everybody else up. All right. Oh. Thank. You. Okay. No worries. Yeah. So these are the limiting beliefs. Um, maybe really quick. So we'll do a few limiting beliefs. I want to see if you can guess what attachment style. They might be, honestly, you can go to any attachment style, but which one do you think would most likely have it? Um, let's do, um, I am abandoned. What attachment style do you think would have this the most? Yeah. Yeah, AP. Um, I'm betrayed. That one is apparently not on here. It's supposed to be. <laughs> yeah. F-A, yeah, mm-hmm. Um, I am trapped or stuck. That one might be a trick question. Yeah, DA. Although FAs could also have that too as well because they can go to the DA side. Um, I am, let's see, where is it? Maybe I am, okay, I am defective. That, who do you think would have that? Um, maybe, but probably people that are more DA would have I am defective. And sometimes um, people that are FA. Um, I don't matter. Some of these are trick questions. Yeah, FA, also AP possibly. Yeah. And again, again, there's um a lot of times like they say that a lot like attachment style might be prone to one or the other. But just because you are that attachment style, remember we're based off of circumstances and how we were raised as a kid or maybe the circumstances that happened after a kid. So that also helps create our beliefs. Yeah. Um, yeah, so back to the other sheet, though, um, uh, let's see. Yeah, so auto suggestion, going back to those limiting beliefs, is basically a way to reprogram those negative beliefs. An example, let's say you have, I will be abandoned. So it's kind of like you're looking for red cars. There's something called the reticular activating system. And you're looking for red cars and you only see the red cars. That doesn't mean yellow cars don't exist. You just are not looking for the yellow cars. What we do with auto suggestion is you start looking for those yellow cars and suddenly you start seeing it. So if you were to go buy a yellow car, you might suddenly notice the yellow cars on the road. It doesn't mean that they didn't exist, but now you're noticing them. So what we do is we look for evidence of the opposite. So if you have the, I am going to be abandoned. Oh yeah, the DA can, yeah, sorry. The DA can see what's wrong with the partner. Yep, mm -hmm. and APC is more what's wrong with themselves. But 
AP tends to, and so did DA, they can have the I'm not good enough core wound. And also people that are FA, they tend to have I'm, I'm bad. But again, like I said, it, yeah, yeah. Especially, yeah, if that makes sense. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. So for the reprogramming, basically you look for the opposite. You would look for how are you connected and you look for evidence. When you use memory plus repetition and you do it like for 21 days, it can help reprogram. And so the, this basically is tips to help auto-suggestion, how to like reprogram. Um, but yeah, that's just a, a gist of that. Um, I think, let me know what you would like to talk about or if you have any questions, because that's pretty much all I have. Um, and I think I gave you all the links. Um, I can give you the link if you want to check out I have free printables on my website. And so I can give you that link if you want those. You can check out the worksheets. Um, I have, I have, think, 12 or nine different ones on there. I also have an Etsy shop as well. Um, and like I said, I have a meetup group. Those are the best ways to stay connected. Um, and like I said, Every other Friday, I do ask the coach, which basically is your chance to do questions. Oh, I'm so glad. I'm so glad you um it helped you understand it. I'm so glad. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else have anything that they want to share or and I'm gonna stop the the share of uh, the the recording. <laughs>